this. Please, sir, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Prabhu. Um, good evening, uh, everyone here. I joined in this program. And uh, uh, it's my duty to uh, do a, a formal uh, you know, welcome address uh, this program. Uh, respected principal, dear colleagues, uh, students, and uh, uh, participants who are joined here from various institutions and friends in abroad who are uh, joined here in this uh, uh, program. I welcome you all. First of all, I must thank uh, our principal. As, uh, uh, his tenure is historic in the history of you know, uh, LNG College. Many developments are happening in our campus in infrastructure administrative administration and more academic activities are initiated with your support and uh, I sincerely welcome you sir and I thank and welcome uh, Dr. Manjunath and uh, Dr. Prabhu for uh, providing uh, and behalf of IC, IQAC for providing uh, technical support to this program and uh, I welcome our colleague, uh, colleague uh, Dr. Anthony Raj. I welcome you all once again. Um, this is an abnormal situation, as you know, even though we have gathered here, um, I'm glad to host this program because uh, you know, the COVID-19 has put the world uh, upside down, uh, normal situation prevailing worldwide and uh, some uh, unusual uh, happenings in some part of the world also you know, bothering us. Um, so this is a, 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 a situation for all of us. Mm. But uh, however, you know, we are connected. We are connected digitally. Um, thanks to IT Jain still working without connecting us, disconnecting us. <laughs> we all connected together. Then ever. Exactly. From different vantage point. Some people are connected out of fear and anxiety. Um, some of us, you know, some of us are uh, connected with the uh, professional responsibility, but only a few uh, are uh, connected uh, with uh, theoretical and social commitment and uh, responsibility, like uh, uh, today's speaker, an organic intellectual, we are passionately calling uh, Dr. Gajendran Ayatrai, uh, Center for Modern Indian Studies, Gardingen University, Germany. I must say a few words about Dr. Gajendra Nayantra. It is my privilege and uh, I used to say something. Yeah, generally, you know, uh, very, I, I admire very few intellectuals uh, to understand the world of uh, uh, dominance and resistance. Uh, most of them are introduced to by Dr. Gajendra in, in the beginning of my career, of course. Uh, like uh, Fanon, Gramsci, uh, uh, Foucault. Uh, of course, Ambedkar, Piriya, Aydas are in Indian context. And uh, two more scholars are very important, uh, whom I admire very much, uh, are uh, Glossius and uh, Dr. Gajendri. Uh, uh, most of you, uh, most of the people here, uh, you know, maybe knowing these two personalities, Glossius, the author of uh, nationalism and quote here, national India. Um, Emancipated Buddhist identity, and he published two volumes of uh, Aitadas Tamil magazine. After the publication of two volumes, a new attention, a renewed attention, uh, a new discourse on uh, Aitadas uh, work, and uh, you know, uh, was uh, uh, initi initiated by uh, social science scholars and uh, public intellectuals nationally. But uh, to continue, Dr. Gajendran has done a very extensive uh, research on Aitadasa's uh, and that is modern Buddhism, Buddhist movement in South India. And uh, he has taken up the intellectual legacy of uh, Ayodhidasa internationally. Uh, the, the credit goes to Dr. Gajendra uh, internationalizing uh, parts of Ayodhidasa uh, main, uh, main topic of uh, social science research in the West. Uh, it is coming up. It is coming up by his effort. And, um, a 
about the uh, topic, but you know, about the topic, I want to say a few words. Um, uh, before that, before that, I want to say one more thing. Uh, uh, it just it, it comes in my mind. Also, yesterday, yesterday I was thinking. This in this present context, in this present situation, I see a similarity between uh, Ayatudas Pandita and Dr. Dajendra. Because Ayatudas, uh, though he started his political social activities as early as 1870s, his major production, major social activities, organizing Sakya Buddhist society, journals, and his major intellectual writings and production were during the peak time of plague capital, the early 20th century, when the whole India was haunted by plague. I mean, at that time, millions of people, in times that uh, no, uh, millions of people in India, also in Madras presidency, it was uh, and also Ayatollah was also actively involved in you know, uh, you know circulating pamphlets uh, about the preventive measures of uh, uh, the measures in the pandemic and other things, and the, that, that the pamphlet issued by um, Ayatollah was uh, very familiar all over the Tamil region at that time. Familiar position. Yes. You, you, you will expect more of I see this similarity. In this situation also the same. Though I, uh, Dr. Gajendran has put in long years of experience in office research and produce like many articles. And, but this, during this time, his production of his academic activities and all, is producing more sincere commitment. He soon he, you know, uh, his uh, research dissertation, you know, PhD dissertation is going to be published in a prestigious press, press in the West. His major articles are going to be put, uh, published in a prestigious journals, international journals soon. And he is active. He is uh, recontextualized. I think continues in this critical situation. So I did see these similarities now. Which is similar. This is what I would say highly kiss Dr. Gajendran's research work highly appreciated by many grants that you can see in his profile. And uh, I want to say a few words on the topic. The topic is very much important, very relevant to any scholars. Why do we need a critical vernacular history and anthropology? It is very relevant to any scholars and other scholars. Yes. Uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 the totality, uh, the, the, the each of the four main words in the topic uh, is theoretically charged and uh, practically significant, uh, functionally turbulent words. What are key words I can see? Because you know, the, the totality of you know, for the fusion of uh, uh, history and the anthropology is a very important tool to understand the totality of any given subject, any particular situation, period, or any social activities. Single uh, uh, disciplinary approach will be insufficient to understand the totality of the subject. I, I, I remember Raymond Williams, uh, he says, uh, to paraphrase, uh, however dominant a, a social system may be, however dominant a social system may be, there is a, you know, it, it, it covers limited activities and social experience and selected activities and social experience. So that uh, it cannot exhaust all social experience. And therefore, uh, it, it potentially contains space for alternative acts, alternative intentions, and uh, alternative social experience, uh, which are waiting to be uh, articulated as a social institution and waiting to be contextualized uh, uh, through fusion of multidisciplinary various disciplines. Particularly history and anthropology. In this context, you know, I see this topic is very important, relevant to uh, you know, scholars who are participating in this 
I welcome the uh, Okay. Uh, before going uh, to the main session, uh, I have some uh, announcements, uh, instruction uh, to the uh, participants here, please. One is uh, that the chat box will be enabled only after 5.30 p.m. Before that, it will be uh, disabled. After 5.30, you can post your questions in the chat box. And another thing, um, that will be a feedback uh, form will be posted in the chat box. After, uh, that will also after 5.30. You can fill it up after 5.30 and leave it in the chat box. So that we can issue, it will be useful to issue certificate. I know the detail will be used to do the certificate and uh, post it. So these are the, some instructions. And I'm also eager to, uh, eager to listen. Uh, I admire a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank Welcome. you. Sure. Um, 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 I would like to um, oh, probably okay. maybe a lot of wait a bit. Uh, okay. Um, um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, this is truly a great pleasure to be with you all. Um, and uh, uh, I really thank the principal of uh, uh, Pondary College, um, you know, for uh, seizing the moment and organizing, letting the faculty members engage in this kind of intellectual uh, activities, uh, uh, even though they are deeply constrained by this COVID-19 situation. Um, so I thank the principal as well as, um, of course, you know, uh, Professor Bala Murugan, uh, whose work I deeply admire and I consider uh, him as the authority on modern Tamil medicine. Um, so his dissertation I've, I've read very closely and it digs up uh, uh, many crucial elements that we do not know about uh, the modern um, history of uh, Tamil Aham. Um, and and uh, and uh, true to his words, I think his own work is interdisciplinary, um, uh, crisscrossing anthropology, Tamil literature, history, um, geography, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, so that is itself is exemplary. Um, his own work is interdisciplinary. No wonder he appreciates, um, you know, some interdisciplinary elements in my um, title. So. Um, I thank him for inviting me for this talk. Um, he was really after me to to find time and you know and then to connect with you all. Certainly, um, uh, I asked him immediately, what the, uh, Professor Balmuru, what are, who are your audiences and so on. And clearly, he mentioned um, you know young scholars and young faculty members in Tamil Nadu. And then he immediately said, uh, I am in um, because. Uh, you know, the ideas that we try, think about, write about, have deep relevance, have to have deep relevance to the grassroots of Tamil Nadu. Uh, and, and, and since uh, the audiences are going to be like that, um, I couldn't have said no. So I agreed and I was mulling over what should be the theme. And then because more, many of you are from diverse disciplines and uh, I thought, you know, I should really, uh, what I've been thinking for a long time, I'm, you know, I'm dissatisfied. I, I have my, I'm trained in history, I'm trained in anthropology, but um, dissatisfied with uh, both disciplines and uh, um, in a way uh, it, uh, they don't enable us to address certain crucial social, cultural and economic and historical aspects of India. Um, so. Given my dissatisfaction, you know, I could always try this theme elsewhere, you know, be it in a conference in Canada or in the US or Europe somewhere. No, I thought this is more relevant to throw up with you, uh, throw it to you and then see, um, and then see how um, I'm able to, uh, you know, um, uh, articulate and then get the feedback from you. So feel free to raise your questions. Um, if I, even if I'm not able to address all of them, I will kind of try to pull and then get back to you. Um, I, and I mean it. Uh, this is not a very modest, uh, generous uh, appreciation of our questions, and I mean it. And I uh, to think through uh, deeply uh, what I'm doing. 
Um, uh, so I thank Professor Balamurugan. I also thank you know Professor Anthony Raja and uh, Professor uh, Prabhu for having coordinated so meticulously and then helping with the technological challenges and so on. Everything is going fine. Um, I'm sure they're going to do more like this in, in the in the in the days uh, to come. So I thank um, them too. Um, so before I quickly go into my um, uh, theme, um, I want to dedicate my talk to the brothers and sisters in the U.S. Uh, this is the twelfth day of protest. Uh, Washington D.C. is under siege by the ordinary people, ordinary brothers and sisters who have had enough. As as Reverend Al Sharpton said in one of the funeral eulogies uh, for uh, Brother George Floyd, you know Reverend Al Sharpton said, "Get your." knee off us. This is a powerful phrase. Get your knee off us. And this getting, you know, so we've been talented. You put as Reverend said, Reverend Al Sharpton said, we've be, we were, we are talented more than the schools you underfunded. And he see immediately says, get your knee off us. I think this get your knee off us has a powerful relevance, not just to America, but to many parts of the world, wherever the oppressed are. So it resonates well with those of us in India who are thinking about the oppressed. When I say oppressed, I don't mean some small group. And I mean um, ma uh, majority of the, uh, I, uh, I, the video, I don't know. Well, I mean the majority, are, are you able to hear me or speak suddenly the video off? Uh, you please switch on that camera, sir. Yeah, uh, I, I switched it on, but again, is that good or no? Uh, it's still off, sir. Uh, oh, it is. Uh, it's still on. Uh, oops. Uh, uh, it may take a minute, sir. Uh, okay. Please continue. Uh, okay. so that I'll continue. We'll see. Um, yes. uh, otherwise, we'll try to re-log in or something. We can try again. Yes. Um, so as we're saying, so that way the the what was happening in uh, the U.S. got tremendous relevance um, to India, and, uh, and 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 that way I think uh, we need to um, uh, we have we need to connect. Uh, yeah. with, uh, okay. Video off. Okay. Okay. One more. Will shall we try? Uh, because it it. Uh, my video is on. Do you think uh, everything else is all right, uh, Prabhu? That's it. Uh, one more time, I'll switch off the video and try again. Is that good? Yeah. Uh, I'll turn turn off the video and turn on again. What do you yes, think? Yeah. Yes, sir. Please do. I'm turning off and turning it on. No, uh, sir, you please uh, turn it off. Okay, I'm turning it. Wait a minute. I'm turning it off. Uh, just a second, sir. It's, yeah, take your time. No problem. It's still off. Okay. Uh, can you please switch on that slide, sir? Slide, okay. I will. Slide. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me start it. Is it good? Uh, sli uh, yes, a slide uh, we can see. Okay. Uh, uh, Okay, so please continue. I'll uh, get back to you oh. in a minute, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so that way, you know, so it is, this has got its relevance uh, to the uh, Indian context. What's going on in the U.S. and so get 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 the knee off us. It's relevant, and then uh, probably we all have to organize multiple seminars and webinars and uh, conferences, video conferences to understand. Uh, uh, what's going on and uh, you know how to connect um, the oppressed across the world um, so I think what is going on right now in the US has got a lot of relevance and um, uh, I think uh, oppressed uh, in India have to uh, learn about it and and organize themselves in the way uh, uh, brothers and sisters are doing in the US all right so um, with that, I want to get into uh, my talk. Um, 
so Prabhu, I would like to, I think I've timed it for some 45 to 50 minutes and probably around 15 minutes, would you be able to give me some five minutes before uh, some notice, some sound or something Prabhu, would you be able to do that? Okay, or, or uh, Professor Balamurgan or anybody, good. So um, what I have in mind is this. Um, so why do we need critical vernacular history and anthropology? Um, uh, excuse so, me, sir. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the interruption, sir. Can you please refresh that page, sir? OK, let me refresh. Uh, where is the refresh? Uh, uh, in the in the address bar, you can. Uh, OK. Uh, so, you know, should I go into the settings and check or? No, no. No, 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 you don't have to, sir. Uh, you okay. can simply uh, select the address bar once, Control uh, A, and then uh, press Enter. Oh, Control uh, uh, A and press Enter. Enter, yes. Okay, I'm doing it. Is it good? Yeah, sir. Yeah, keep that cursor in the enter yeah, address bar and press enter, sir. Just okay. Uh, address bar. Yeah. Uh, do you see that refresh icon nearby the uh, near this uh, address? Uh, the home page, home icon, and then the mm. refresh icon. No, I'm not able to see. Should okay. Uh, I don't. I don't have to select the enter. Uh, I mean, the whole address and then enter or something. No, right? No. Uh, yes, sir. Please do. Do that. Do that, sir. Okay. The whole address and then enter? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, you have joined the room. And. Uh, wow. Okay. So now, can you please uh, yeah. switch on the camera, sir? Yeah, I switched it on. It's not popping up. Oh. Okay. Can, uh, is the uh, sir? Uh, you know, Gajendra, sir. Ah, uh, sir. Gajendra, sir. Gajendra, sir. Uh, so, uh, sir? Okay, okay. Uh, sir. Ah, sir, line to the or no, or no, phone la president. Okay. Sir, hello. Uh, sir, welcome back. Uh, can you please switch on that camera, sir? Uh, wait a minute. I'll try to do that now. Yes. Wait. Yeah. 
Is it clear now? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Visible. You are visible, sir. Sorry, sorry for that uh, trouble, not sir. Clear, well, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. It's all Thank good. You, all good. No Pleasure. problem. It happens. Sometimes the glitch would happen, so don't yes. worry about. It. Is yes, my is my voice clear? Perfect, it... sir. Perfect. Yes, sir. Visible. Uh, so um, sorry, friends, for the uh, you know technology some some glitch, and I think it should be good hereafter. All right. So as I was saying, uh, so probably a quick request. So I plan to take you know maybe my talk would be around 50 minutes or so 40 to 50 minutes and yes, could sir. you caution me around 45 minutes or so so that i can i sure that i will sure that i will do that sir. thank you thank, thank you. you so much so um as i was saying um um reverend alshafton said in his speech uh, you know the funeral of uh, brother george floyd get the knee off us um so in other words what he was trying to say was african-americans uh, that brought in, you know, in around 1619. That's when we have a major presence of slavery. Slavery. Africans who are enslaved and called as slaves happens in 1619 uh, in uh, Virginia. Of course, there were some Africans who were, brought, you know, brought elsewhere too by the Spanish colonizers and so on. But 1619 is considered as a watershed moment. Uh, for uh, slavery in the U.S. So some of the thinkers and uh, of African Americans clearly said we were brought in into this country and we were enslaved. From then onwards, your knee has been on us. So take it off now. Uh, that's how they are speaking. And this has got a tremendous relevance for us uh, in India. So uh, especially from the marginalized majority of Indians. So, uh, so, and then you see the wave of interracial uh, young people, old people coming together and protesting in the US, such a situation has to happen in India. Um, um, and, you know, that means our theory, our thinking, our philosophy, our political practice, our politicians, uh, all of them have to really battle it through to be very creative, to be integrative, to be inclusive, to civilize the oppressor, and you know how the leadership should be with the uppers, like the Africans, uh, Americans are doing in the U.S. Um, uh, you know it has got to, got to happen. So in a way, uh, I therefore I am I'm, I'm, for the past twelve days or so I'm deeply disturbed by what's happening in the U.S. because having lived in the U.S. for long, in a way I'm connected with the society. I lived in Harlem for long. Harlem is part of my life in that way. So uh, it's it's in a way I dedicate my uh, talk to. Uh, um, the African American brothers there, as well as for the oppressed uh, millions and oppressed majority in, in India. Okay, good. Now on to my uh, talk. Um, so um, I, my, the title of my talk is "Why Do We Need Critical Vernacular History and Anthropology?" Um, so uh, let me move the. Okay. Um, all right, uh, next. Good. So uh, why did I go into this, uh, you know, history? Like, so, uh, you know, from my title, you, you know, I want you to definitely support history, definitely support anthropology. Uh, but I'm saying something uh, like uh, Professor Balamurgan said, uh, what do we mean by critical? What do we mean by vernacular? I want to break it down right at the beginning so that I take you slowly into my theme as we go along. Now, history. So we all know, all many, I'm sure majority uh, among you are um, um, uh, historians, I guess, and so you all clearly know, you know, um, ancient medieval modern history. But I'm trying to have a little bit of a tilt to understand pre-colonial. What I put as AMM is ancient medieval and modern. Uh, so all this could be, you know, put in the pre-colonial time itself. Uh, and then from, you have a colonial from 1757. So India was into modernity, some people call it early modernity. Before the colonization itself, we were exporting cotton, uh, probably the best country exporting cotton at the time, um, in the say 16th century, 17th century. Um, Egypt was competing with us very closely on that. So we were early moderns in a way. Uh, and then the colonials come and sit and cut our thumbs to avoid, uh, you know, that we should not be the great weavers. And majority of the weavers were the oppressed and the marginalized, but they were thriving 
in the 16th, 17th century onwards. So you can put the whole pre-colonial with this ancient medieval modern, and then we have colonial time and then post-colonial. Okay. Now, this complex history or histories of our country has been uh, how have we understood how uh, this discipline is taught in our universities and colleges and schools. Usually, you know, in schools it is dominated by the nationalist theory. You know, all of our young boys and girls should only know about the independence or some bit of a romantic golden ancient age uh, where there were no problems, milk, you know, honey and uh, everything was flowing, crisscrossing across our country. That's how the ancient history is dealt. Medieval, oh, probably the Muslim guys came and ruined that kind of thing, the tone and tap. <clears throat> probably Akbar is celebrated. Probably some one or two other Mughal rulers. Mostly that's how the medieval is portrayed. And then the nationalist history, the ultimate nation emerged and so on. That's one set of theory. And then countering that we have what is called post-colonial theory, you know. So we have, you know, colonizers that come, all kinds of Europeans that come, which is, which is true. And from 1757, British took over and then uh, literally they ruined our country, which is also true. And then the post-colonial theory is developing a critique against colonialism in a big way. All right. So, so that is post-colonial theory. Uh, and then, um, you know, so they literally, in an essence, we can say post-colonial theory. Uh, is a critique of everything that is connected with colonialism, right? Uh, the exploitation, you know, uh, uh, the language imposition, English imposition. We are, all of us are struggling. We are we are screwed up uh, in our mother tongues, and we are ruined. And, you know, we are all also not able to master the English to the level of, you know, what is what is to dominate to the other English speakers across the world, or to be at par with. It's difficult. So we are. In a way, torn apart. For 10 minutes, we, nobody can speak Tamil without using a Tamil. That is a sad situation uh, without using an English word. Um, uh, so I, it's a tragedy, right? Um, so that way, we kind of, I do understand the impact of colonialism, post colonial theory talks about that. And then came subaltern theory and history, which is actually history uh, from below, you know. How do we understand? So we, they talk about Shantal movement and some pockets here and there. And, they, uh, and then talk about how they were rebelling against the colonialists and so on. Uh, very few talk about uh, the oppressed in India, talk, you know, rebelling against uh, the oppressors uh, in India itself. That is sadly subaltern theory could not deal with. So the oppressors in India, there are multiple types of oppressors in India who've been there uh, from ancient time, you know. So we have had oppressors in ancient days, medieval days, you know, early modern time. And, and do we have any theoretical perspective? Subaltern theory has anything to say about? I'm not really sure. Unfortunately, um, uh, or fortunately, subaltern theory's uh, shop is closed. Um, there is not open anymore. They seem to, I don't know what went wrong. I don't know, probably they didn't have a clue to continue any further. They were running short of ideas. The show is over. So um, subaltern theory is gone. Now, of course, feminist theory is very much there, very vibrant, and then um, you know it is. It is in a way still. You know, we have there are people who are talking about from 1960s how feminist is different now and so on. So all this definitely among these theories, I think feminist theory has a lot more interesting things to teach us um, and, and transform us as of now. Uh, but it's not without constraints. You will see that soon in my talk. So, so this is how history is understood, right? From these four um, theoretical models. Now, uh, anthropology. How is it done? So, anthropology. Very quickly, you all know, but I want to quickly run through this. So, um, anthropology has archaeology, uh, four major components. There are philosophical anthropology and so on. I don't want to go into that. But four major uh, discipline of sort of parts of anthropology are these, you know, um, archaeology, for example, Kiradi, you know, so uh, Ayodhya, they're trying to dig up, but the latest thing about Ayodhya is Buddhist uh, uh, materials are getting un unearthed. Hopefully the, the, the demagogues and, and, and the bloodthirsty blood Hindutva uh, brothers and sisters, hopefully they understand from the Buddhist materials that are coming out of Ayodhya right now. So, 
and Kiridi doesn't have thankfully any reference to Shaivite or Vaishnavite. It's beyond caste. It's beyond uh, religious divide. So thankfully we we have Kiridi in Tamil Nadu. So archaeology is a very important component of anthropology. We are, we are getting to know about our own history in a new light. And the physical anthropology talks about evolution. You know how there is a connection between apes and humans. How we have evolved. Um, say 10 million years ago and clearly you know um, Homo erectus and then how we have become Homo, homo sapiens and so on so all right in the in the last two and two million years or so homo sapiens. So so all this is nicely physical anthropology we understand evolution and then we have linguistic anthropology How do we understand languages of humans? So history of languages linguistics. That's what I put as lens in uh, I didn't have space so, you know, um, all that, uh, philology, all of them go into linguistic anthropology. And then we have cultural anthropology, talking about, for instance, Aryans, and whether they invaded, whether they migrated, or, well, who are Dravidians, who are Tamils, etc., etc., we talk about. And that's cultural anthropology. Now, all these are there, but the most important thing is, we must understand there is an obsession with the non, when the anthropology discipline started in the 19th century, uh, you know, first in England and then the first time, you know, in the US was at Columbia University from 1880s onwards. Uh, so where I also studied. And, uh, so, so uh, you know, but there has been an obsession with non-Western. There's a sort of orientalization, you know, Occident is Europe, Oriental is, you know, Asia and, and uh, non-European uh, zones, basically. So there was a condescending uh, looking down upon attitude. And then romanticizing, exoticizing. So that's what I'm saying. What is orientalization is literally the point I have below. So you eroticize, you know, so that you, on the one hand, you looked at the non Western people as browns, blacks, uh, you know, that kind of looked down. But at the same time, their bodies were sexually attracted, eroticizing them um, for the non white people. So you, on the one hand, you degrade, you primitivize. You are primitive, I say. You are, you know, at the same time, I sexualize, I exploit, and I hegemonize, I dominate. So, all this has been anthropology played a very vital role. So, during our own colonial times, colonial anthropologists played a very vital role. They went around measuring our noses. Uh, in Africa, they measured even the penises of men and then breasts of women and, and, and bottoms of men and women and humiliated them, right, as monkeys. So we were also called as browns and uh, low low humans. That was colonial anthropology. So this is what I mean. That's how it has been. Uh, now, thankfully, uh, things are changing in the way they look at anthropology. Now, the, therefore, we need to have uh, to move away from this kind of romanticization, primitivization, and and orientalization. We need to critique the anthrop anthropological, uh, you know, critique historical and anthropological methods. That's what I say in this slide. Um, so we need to ask, uh, is histor historical theory and practice and, um, at crossroads, do, do they help me to understand my positive history? Or they continue to talk about how I was primitivized, how I was dominated, how I was sexualized, how I was, uh, you know, uh, hegemonized. You continue to do that, you still don't um, give me a, a good historical method to understand myself my community, my my culture, my religion, my nation, right? So therefore, historical theory, I'm borrowing that theory, practice means institutions. Okay, Indian Association of History, who are running that institution? American Historical Association, and where I have presented papers in different venues of US, who are running that? Do the African Americans run or the whites run? What have they done with that? You see, so on the one hand, theoretically at Columbia University, say in the early 20th century, there were professors, anthropologists and history, historians who said, yes, there is a clear mental difference between the whites and the blacks. So professors of Columbia University were churning out ideas. This is what W.E.B. Du Bois called, I am thankful to him, which I'm using it for Indian context, the propaganda of history. It is not history. It's a propaganda. Propaganda by who? By the white races. Who were they? They were not the crude, uh, you know, thugs type on the street. They were professors of Columbia churning out racist theories. That W.B. Du Bois, the first African American PhD holder from Harvard University, and a pioneering, pioneering African American thinker 
Who talked about Dravidian Buddhism? That's why I dedicated my dissertation at Columbia to him also. He connected Buddha and, and he talked about Africans moving into India and so on. He wrote even a novel called um, uh, Dark Water talking about India. So, W.B. Du Bois. So, that way, the propaganda of history has been going on. It's still the case. The propaganda was in the early 20th century in India. It is the case in the post colonial time, too. So, we need to ask the question anthropological theory and practice. What are the new tools to understand the oppressed in India in a positive way? Yeah, oppressed have been broken, their lands have been taken, their bodies are mutilated today, right now, right? Yeah, but give us a little more that how the oppressed have not been crying all the 24 hours. They were also creating things, they were also making things, they were also producing, they were also contributing to the oppressors, right? And so they have their positive culture, positive religion, positive identity. Can we talk about their positive identity? Oh, you're talking about identity politics. Get off, they would say, anthropologists and historians. They are wrong. When I begin to talk about positive identity of myself, they say, that's my identity politics. When the African-Americans now, even after brother, you know, George Floyd has been need, when they ask themselves, we are not slaves. We are equal humans. We are also Americans. We have our own ways of living. Would you respect or not? Uh-oh, don't ask that. You are talking about identity politics. If you say that, that's what for the past 500 years also, the white Americans have been saying, and they are still saying, that is why the cities are burning right now. And thankfully, they are all, it's not they are one to only burning. They're saying that's not the right way. We all have to come together. So the white progressive anti-race folks are leading. Likewise, India, where are our progressive folks? So are, are there historical methods and anthropological methods that can provoke our Indians to civilize themselves better, to come together beyond many barriers? We'll come to the barriers later, but as of now I'm saying, so that means the disciplines of history and anthropology are at cross, crossroads. So why we need to understand why there are it is a crossroads crossroads is going this way this way that way that's what i mean the crossroads it's not helping me to emancipate to go you know in a way in a progressive way i'm not saying linearly it has got to go that way no i want you know you give me ways multiple ways crisscrossing ways that's fine but it has to immense you know help me to understand myself and and my people my way of living as, as no less to any human, other human, anywhere in the world. So if our histories and anthropologies are not helping us, then we need to ask, where did we go wrong? So that's where the fieldwork methods and so on, you know, this is what I'm saying. You know, you, you ask a history scholar, where you mostly meet them in, the, in our state archives in Edmore. I was there for many months. I met some of you there. Um, and in fact, the, you know, Professor Raghubadi, um, who's a, a pioneering historian in a big way, I admire him a lot. I don't know whether he's here in, this, in our group right now, but I admire his work. He, um, he teaches in Dindivanam. I, I, I don't know. Uh, he, he invited me and I went and spoke at Dindivan College in Tamil. Uh, that was one of the best days in my life. So I thank you for that. So, so you know, I met him in the state archives, you see. Uh, so that way, state doctors, you know, it brings people at the same time, it's all sort of censored, uh, sanitized, sanitized, cleaned up, uh, nice records, out of which do you think we can dig up all the histories, positive histories, positive cultures, positive religions of the oppressed in India? I'm not sure. I leave it to you. So, and also we are oppressed with written texts, written archives that are neatly kept in the racks of our state archives. Or in Abra, they would say, go to India office library in London. I've been there. So that's how they would say. But I don't know whether we can dig up our positive history from those libraries in London and in our state archives in India. You gotta go beyond. So that's that's my thinking. So anthropology. So what have they done? Yes, look at this from objects to subjects. African Americans were brought as slaves and they were given a title called Negroes. Their bodies were mutilated. Animals were treated better. Our brothers and sisters, African Americans, were humiliated as Negroes. In India, many of our, you know, one fifth of our population are still being called untouchables. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Yes, untouchables. Oh, I'm sorry. We use the word balance, means oppressed, right? But is there anything that we can talk about beyond their oppression? Is there anything that we can talk about them as simple humans with their own positive culture interconnected with others? I don't have a clear idea. We need to battle it out theoretically, historically. That's what I mean from, you know, from objects to subjects, they move and then from subjects to interlocutors. We don't call, you know, I was talking to somebody who's a, who's a subject, you know, we are interlocutor. Interlocutor means developing a dialogue between people, right? So that's happening, that's really good. So now taking the non-Western languages seriously, all these are happening. But I think I have a last point, note, I'm just, I'm just tickling, but saying we have failed. We have failed. And, um, you know, why? That's why the race problem is still there. George Floyd, brother George Floyd's death. And then caste, COVID-19 and violence. Right now, some brother, is, a brother in Tamil Nadu has been tied to a tree and burnt alive. Please check, I got the message, right? So COVID, COVID situation lockdown is used to hound those leaders, those ordinary men and women who have raised voice against casteism. So, where are we? Where are we now? How, how are our theories, anthropological theories and histories, how do they help? Do they help? So, and then of course, gender problems, uh, race, um, caste, they are all sort of uh, manufactured and, 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 uh, and then um, the borders are maintained through women. Oh, he peaced our women. You know, oh, he is falling in love with the, our women. Who, who are they? I mean, uh, which man can take the right to talk about uh, their own women, right? So, so the moment you know, um, our movies, everything talks about love. This is stupidity, right? Every Indian movie is about love, right? And that too, radical love. But in reality, when young men and women fall in love, their organs have to be cut. They have to be fathers organize the death in our distinguished Dravidian land, right? We know about that. So, so that means can we change these minds through our histories and the anthropologies, theories, and practices? We need to really think seriously. That's what probably I'm hinting at. So, and then we have this, you know. So problems in historical anthropological theory and practice about the non-Western people. So Return, like I said, return as privilege, state archives, and re-privileging, re-privileging the privilege. Repeatedly we do that. You know, um, yes, Carnatic music, for instance, Tiaharaja. I read through a lot of biographies of Tiaharaja. It begins with, Tiaharaja was born in this Gotra, this Brahmin family. I'm done. Tiaharaja is not part of my culture. My culture is casteless. Does he belong to mine or not? I, if, if, or no. And what about his music? Is it called for common or only for a few? Professor Uma Chakravati had come for a conference last year. I asked her to talk about music and dance. I asked her, look, um, is there a way that Carnatic music and Carnatic you know, dance forms can reach the majority people? As of all, it is ghetto wise. It is, it is for the only privilege. She clearly said, no, there is no chance of these music traditions going to the majority. Therefore, she said she stopped watching uh, Carnatic, you know, uh, Carnatic dance forms and then music forms and so on. So that way, uh, uh, we need to ask, you know, whatever we celebrate seem to re-privilege the privilege. So that's what I mean. Uh, our ethnography also, Brahmin male power is continuously glorified, right? Um, who are the big leaders? And so uh, we talk about mostly the privileged caste men as the leaders. Women are absolutely wiped out from this history and all that. So then, on the one hand, we re-privilege the privilege. On the other hand, we re-marginalized re -marginalized the oppressed. Okay? Somehow, okay, we were insulting them as untouchables. Then we called them depressed classes. Then we called them scheduled cars. Then we called them or weaker sections. Now we have reached the level of Dalits. Okay? That's the progress we have made. We don't know where are going to be. We are stuck there from the 1990s. Dalit, Dalit, Dalit. In Tamil Nadu, if you go into the interior, Please do interview people. Ask, do you know the word Dalit? They would say, no. I have crisscrossed. I, I live in, you know, many villages. I continue to do that. I stay in slums. I eat in slums. And I've had best food after my mother from a sister, you know, in one of the places which is called a slum, right? So, so I connect. 
I, I'm a local man, like me, you know, many of you. So I do understand. So when you ask them what is happening through this term Dalit, they would say, what do you mean exactly? What do you mean exactly Dalit, broken? What do you mean we broken? They will ask. We better be prepared to define them then and let's not put them on a spot condescendingly as ignorant people. They don't even know the word Dalit. They don't even understand the word JB. Let's, so let's not insult them. They have lived like you and me and they've been living a lot more gloriously, positively, creatively that we are not in a position to articulate even, write or speak. We don't have theories, we don't have good practices. That's what I mean. So what do we do as academics and activists? Um, speakers, readers, writers. I don't want to prevent just the writers. Many of us speak, many of us read. and I have to, So um, uh, when you go into that, that's when, first of all, I think that the common sense understanding has to be attacked. We all very clear, he said this, we don't want to raise the question, like, is it true? Why? What are the evidences? Can we explain rationally? That's what people like Tas said. You give me, that's what Buddha said. No God, nothing. You tell me, explain right now, I want to understand. Likewise, Tas said, no, 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 don't, 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 uh, you know, fool around by saying my previous birth and after like, right now I'm suffering. Right now I'm living well. Can you join hands? Can you eat my food? Can you, would you like to come along? Can we be together? Now, if you have problems, then you have something else. Imagined exclusionary attitude. Imagined. That means it's not real. You've been fooling around with your race, caste, gender discrimination. So, and all of them are built through commonsensical views, right? So, thankfully, in the world, some new theories have come that are attacking commonsensical. Common sense means something like what uh, uh, Bodhi was said as doxa, you know, the public uh, uh, opinion. That's what I mean, you know. So the so common sense has to be attacked uh, because common sense has promoted racism, common sense has promoted casteism, common sense has promoted all along the subordination of women, uh, you know, and girls. So it is still the case, right? Um, so you can't understand the status of Brahmin women in the medieval times, in the early modern, modern times, because only Brahmin males dominated and produced texts, and they are in between the lines you can read and figure out, but it's difficult. That's what the Sanskrit is saying. So in the racial context, we have critical race theory that says very simply, anything connected with race, racism is a problem, we need to attack and give up. It is a social problem. So that's critical theory. And likewise, intersectionality, uh, a person who is attacked by race is also under class. It's also gender component. Usually the men uh, take the lead in talking about the racialized situation. Black men. No, no, you have to talk about black girls and black women. That's what the intersectionality theory taught us, right? And then the feminist theory was a, for a long time white feminist theory in the, in the, in the West. Now African Americans, African American feminist theory. African British feminist theory and it goes on and at this time we have we have our own Indian feminist critical class um, uh, theory and we have exemplary leaders uh, you know women who have been before us we need to dig up in modern time so so and therefore people like David Unipon David Unipon who is that you know of course professor Prabhu uh, has worked a dissertation on Australia and um, uh, Australian Aborigines so David Unipon, who lived between 1872 and 1967, was somebody like Ambedkar. He was multiple uh, language uh, person, you know, he knew, I think, Latin and all that, very creative, big inventor. And then when I started reading about him many years ago, uh, in one of the books, the, the, the person says, the very first thing is dedicated, David Unipon says, I belong to a great community called Dravidians. Imagine. David Unipon of Australia, Australian Aborigines, he belongs to a community called Ingaridri. So, Ingaridri community. So, uh, he, you know, David Unipon dedicated Australian Aborigines whole culture as something connected with the Dravidian community in a big way. I, was, I had goosebumps. So, you know, pioneering intellectual, then Grams, she fell on WB, I'm not simply dropping names. You all know definitely more than me, but I'm saying how these thinkers are trying to help us to go beyond the common sense. How do you critically understand space, racialized space? How the street is organized? How the town is organized in America? 
in Europe, we need to question. That's what they say, right? W. B. Du Bois did as an organic intellectual. In our own land, uh, in Tamil Nadu, in Tamil Nadu, we have Swapnil Sriambal, who lived between 1846 and 1936. She was she lived as as, as a Buddhist and passed away as a Buddhist, as um, you know, uh, and and uh, and she was a Buddhist icon for many. Uh, like and he was a close associate of Ayutthaya. So they, they are organic intellectuals. I see commonalities between the last sentence about future possibilities of global and local interconnections of who, not the privileged. I think the time has come to an end between the privileged white guys interacting with the privileged uh, caste fellows in India. It, the time is up. You don't have anything productive to give to majority of us who've been struggling to and we've been holding on to our histories, cultures, religions, which are inclusive. We are not exclusionary. How your theories helped us? That time has to come to an end. So I'm saying, using, I'm submitting it to you. I don't have any hope from the existing historical theories and practices. I don't have any hope from the existing anthropological you know, uh, theories and practices, any possibility of reconstructing the history or an anthropology of the oppressed in a positive way anytime soon. Unless our organic intellectuals are taken seriously. And I'm not trying to put myself into that. No, I'm still learning. There have been pioneers before us. Men and women take our organic intellectuals seriously. That's an appeal I'm making. Now, let's move to the next slide. So, possibilities of critique. Uh, um, one of the sort of um, uh, possibilities in critiquing. Uh, so, I clearly see th two things operating in in promoting the common sense, uh, the privilege in the West or privilege in India, two things they do. So the privileged men, white or Brahmin or whatever, they they create certain norms. Particularly on the idea of Purush, the idea of Brahman. Ask anybody to explain the nuts and bolts of Brahma, Brahman, all that. Ayurveda rips into the idea of Brahman. You've been cheating us with that idea. Demonstrate what is it? What is the Atma? Demonstrate it. So the metaphysical aspects of Brahman, Atma, all that, you know, that is really a sophisticated nonsense. Time, we don't take this kind of Brahminical idea seriously. I think they should be thrown down the drain. You don't have to have the idea of Brahman, which is not equalizing, which is not horizontalizing people. If those ideas don't help, down the drain, please. So on the one hand, there is, you create an idea, you make it a norm. Yeah, this is what Purush said. This is what Manu said. This is what, and you create a norm. This is how it is. No boy or a, no man, young woman, young man should not come together because they have something called caste, something called race. No, there is no love beyond race and caste. That's what they say. A norm has been created, arranged marriage, all that has been put in place as norms. And then what is happening? Next word, naturalized. It is like a rock, they would say. It's like a mountain. It's like a tree. It's again a sophisticated nonsense. Caste, race, gender are man-made, right? So, so, so the, the, the gender inequalities. I mean, yeah, I do clearly understand the biological aspects of men, biological aspects of men. Yes, but and then biological aspects of intersex. But don't try to say now people are changing. We have lesbians adopting babies, and they are families. Do I recognize or not? Those humans want, lesbians want to call themselves as families and I as a male, I better, as a heterosexual, better accept that. Otherwise, I'm disregarding my fellow humans who want to live in a different way without harming me, right? So these are the ideas. First, it was normativized and then naturalized and we need to really interrogate that. That's what I mean in this. These questions are important. Please keep this slide in mind. I'm asking a very important thing that we have not raised very seriously about our village in Tamil Nadu, for instance, or India. Why is a village spatially structured so? Have we asked? I draw to the friends, maybe I can try and quickly, hopefully my uh, video doesn't go. Uh, yeah, uh, do you see my whiteboard? Okay, so something like village means, oh uh, yeah, it might not work here, my other laptop would. Okay, so um, uh, your village means what? 
huge temple, nice water in the temple area, and then surrounded by uh, a nice agrahara, and then you know the privileged groups, and then it goes like the concentric circle. I draw it on the board and teach my students. And the end we have what is called cherry, people who work the land around the year, and they don't even have a home of their own. And what they produce, the fellows sitting in the concentric circle, like I would say, eat like ducks, swallow it up. That food is not untouchable, but the producers are untouchable, you see. So, and that's how the village is structured. Has Ram made it, or Vishnu made it, or uh, any other goddess, you know, uh, made it? We need to question that. So I'm asking, yeah, why is the village spatially structured? So is there any way we can change the concentric circle so that people can come together? We need to restructure. So likewise, has a village always been designed so? Always? God has given that way? I'm not sure. Now, who are the agents of such a design of such villages? Why is a temple? It's like the temple is of huge walls, like a fortress. Who designed it? And what, you know, who are the, the trustees of temples now who are running and the temple lands running into thousands of acres? Each temple in the, you know, in some parts of Tamil Nadu, thousands and thousands of acres benefiting the privileged, right? And the workers are the marginalized. And they don't even have a regular food and they are dying right now, as we know. So uh, we need to understand are there socio cultural economic differences of the oppressors? You know, uh, on the oppressed. Can we see, you know, between them and not, not the same? How do we understand the history, cultural, religion, economy of the oppressed in a positive way? Their positive memory. So, what are the alternative historical anthropological tools? That's what I want to throw up and ask. Uh, I don't have a clear answer, but the critique, these questions are important for me. Maybe I'll throw up some ideas, but I'm still mulling over like all of you. Um, so, that's when the vernacular becomes important. Now, what has been the vernacular? Vernacular has already been used by many guys. You know, there's one Sanskritist uh, at Columbia University, Sheldon Pollock, pioneering important Sanskritists. I appreciate him. But I have serious problems in the way he thinks about Sanskrit. There is a cosmopolitan Sanskrit across some, the subcontinent, and it broke down into vernacular languages. Ayatollahs will rip apart Sheldon Pollock right now. Ayatollahs would say, no, there are multiple languages. Sanskrit was also is one group who would have had it. Pali another group, Tamil another. They were all independent creation of humans, and they took to Buddhist ideas in the in their own way to to become better humans. Right, that's what's thus. So the cosmopolitan is the bigger high culture, continental culture, vernacular is local, small. That is the attitude. I don't accept that kind of a position. For me, you know, um, and then of course the other points are there, you know, the national, uh, vernacular is regional, and, uh, national is literary, high culture, and then colloquial, you know, is vernacular and so on. But for me, as I say in the note, vernacular equals the language of the people. If you want to reconstruct the history of the people, culture of the people, you need to, we need to break our heads in their own language. Let's not go to the state records to dig up the, our people's history. Let's not go to the state records. Oh, state records doesn't talk about um, Buddhism in Tamil Nadu. There was no Buddhism. Sadly, one of the very important uh, linguistic historians did that uh, from Howard. Um, so she, and that's why Ayutthaya was not found till 1990s. Thanks to Aloysius again, um, you know, who's opened up in a big way uh, about in you know, alternative histories of Tamils. Castless Tamils, Sadiatra Tamilakhan. So their history we came to know in a big way through Ayutthaya. Without Ayutthaya, there is no Peria. Ayutthaya said, "Why are you from the granite? What is granite? The idols of the gods and goddesses." The moment I read, I said, "Peria is nothing. Literally, Peria followed Ayutthaya." How many of us know? Had I not read that archive? in the 90s and, and worked hard to produce a dissertation, I wouldn't have changed my mind. It wouldn't have changed my body and mind in a way that to tell I am also a costless Indian, costless Tamil. Right? I'm introducing a very important phrase, 
casteless jadi yatra thamir and it's not my invention it is for generations of organic intellectuals have done it i am a follower so that means there are caste thamirs right and we should not their history their anthropology we don't accept it's it's hierarchizing so vernacular for me is the language of the people and therefore we need to ask the question how do i critically understand the history and culture of the people in their own language so uh, uh, that's what so and then tamil studies tamil studies there here and there and some departments are coming in the in the west uh, all that but we need to ask is tamil like we asked about history is tamil studies at crossroads that's why i'm asking why why am i saying tamil studies at crossroads because we're in the beginning you know it's not even full fledged uh, tamil you know extraordinary department in the west yet um so if it's any time it will come but they have to be alert to some of these questions i'm asking therefore how has caste tamil studies been normativized and naturalized caste tamil studies ipdi da modhiliya irundar ipdi da pillaigal irundanga ipdi da velaalargal indha varalaaru ipdi da ayyar irundanga ipdi da ayyanga irundanga glorious i don't think it is it's tamil history that is a caste history you don't even say caste tamil history is a contradiction if you want to be called as tamil the language that all of us speak you cannot bring in your caste okay so who are the who what is the what is the, what is the role of the oppressed communities to help you know in, in the very evolution of tamil language do we know i was influenced as a child this is where i am using for the first time in the talk i was influenced in my language by nahur hanifa as a child இறைவனிடம் கையேந்துங்கள் அவன் இல்லை என்று சொல்வதில்லை வாட் மோர் தன் தி இறைவன் அண்ட் சோ ஆன் அஸ் அ சைல்ட் தி வே ஹி ப்ரொனௌன்ஸ் கிரிப் மீ அண்ட் ஐ ஹேவ் தி ஃபார்ச்சூன் ஆஃப் சீயிங் ஹிம் சிங்கிங் இன் அவர் ஃபேமிலிஸ் மேரேஜ் சோ ஐம் சேயிங் திஸ் சோ வாட் இஸ் தி ரோல் ஆஃப் இஸ்லாமியர்ஸ் கான்ட்ரிபியூஷன் முஸ்லிம்ஸ் கான்ட்ரிபியூஷன் டு தமிழ் லாங்குவேஜ் டு பி நோ டு பி நோ தி இன்ஃப்ளூயன்ஸ் ஆஃப் கிறிஸ்டியன்ஸ் இன் அவர் தமிழ் லாங்குவேஜ் much before carl dwell also i want to know so we have also so that way we celebrate who is from in our ayer his contribution tata they say yes sir but do have you talked about in your language about my own people's positive history and memory if you are not thank you please take your books go away i want to write i want to dig up i want to understand my own people i would say so that way we need to question this um, caste tamil studies uh, vis-a-vis uh, caste free so so uh, we need to ask have there ever been caste free tamils tamilarhal sadhya to tamilarhal caste free tamils if yes who are the who are these women who are these men who are these children we need to ask uh, what are the caste free moments and movements in tamil history we need to ask and then what are the local evidences that i can collect oral evidence or not just the written ah i go speak to a landless uh, laboring brother or sister tell us you say yes my grandfather invented this manvetti ho oh, in english my you know he found out a solution to to make sure this in in the nell na konja naal irukum abdinu avaru potar indha vadai ipdi valathudhu this paddy he invented he sort of uh, you know he discovered and then worked on it and genetically changed that's how we could get this and that brother wouldn't have left a written note but he has got memory that has come from his grandfather how many books have we read to talk about our people's our people means caste free tamils technologies products um inventions do we have anthropology hello where are you guys how many uh, anthropologists have come and studied from the west why have not they talked about these aspects have they talked about like professor balaburgan writes you know tamil medicine have you cared to understand the casteless tamil tamils contribution to siddha medicine have you cared if we have not done we have done politics too so that way how do i understand caste free knowledge traditions that's what i mean by knowledge traditions multiple aspects music dance medicine the clear lowest denomination the clear mark has to be the question is is it caste free or caste oriented anything caste oriented doesn't belong to the positive tamil history it is negative and that has to be kicked out 
So that's my submission. So or the instance of caste free communities, we need to dig up. Let's not romanticize Sangha. Ah, look, thankfully, Kiridi is there. There is a potential. All of us can break our head. Don't wait for an archaeologist or a historian, anthropology from the West to come and give you some ideas. No. Sit in our own room, ask, why is that? One of my own, my nephew's daughter uh, is Adini. This word comes from KAD. You see how the castless communities are built? The word is already, as if my nephew was waiting, my nephew and my nephew's wife, you know, generally they were waiting for this kind of emancipation. They've come together. They've woken class. They've helped the next generation to be cost free too. KAD was the reason. And there's been a long history. So we need to understand, uh, that's what I mean. Um, uh, so towards critical vernacular history and anthropology, okay? So um, so we need to really historicize caste for women in terms of, like I said, anthropology. Now, let, when I say anthropology, the culture of caste free and Tamils, what, how many books have you read about our fisher folks? We love our Vanjaram mean. We love our Matti mean. We love our Karwad. I love my Karwad. You know, so childhood, my, my college life, once I got back from JNU as a student, I would eat Padayad and not fried uh, dry fish. Sukta Karwad. That's my favorite food. I celebrate it. Is there any book that talks about how um, dry fish has been made or how our my fisher folk who have, give, who have given me the best fish possible and the best. Excuse meat. me, sir. Sorry. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Okay. Uh, sir uh, you asked me to inform you regarding the thank time, you. sir. It's, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank I'll wind up very soon. I'm in time. I'm in time. So, thank you. So, I'm almost in the last thank couple you. of slides. So, I'm good. Thank you, Prabhu. So, so, that way, how do we talk about, you know, the Fisher folks, positive history? How many articles have you come about in Tamil? Why have we not cared to talk about our Fisher folks on the coastal belt? In detail, go sit with them interview how do they go into the sea what are the what are the fish they they get for us how do they process we got to write how who are the customers only the marginalized people only the you know the oppressed people go and buy the fish likewise the meat makers have we written about anthropologically historically about our meat makers about our agriculturists at Columbia again with the professor Daniel Valentine Dale when I was discussing about what I wanted to do of course I had gone to work on Ayatitas so he said, Gajendran, stop everything. I've heard enough from you. And I think you have tons of ideas to talk about the grassroots level, agriculturists, and, 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 and the meat makers and fishermen. Just start, start your dissertation on them. <laughs> I said, thank you, sir. No. I have, I have bigger, bigger, bigger uh, responsibility. We've just you know, rediscovered tasks, and I have to battle my head on that. And his theory, his thinking, his institutions, and so on. So, but the potential is there to work on all these themes, right? So, so, but that calls for Tamil proficiency. Don't let's not bother about English and so on. Let's not wait for an English theorist to come and teach you or us. No, Tamil. Every kid, every uh, every kid in our family has to have a proficiency in Tamil. Tamil belongs to the costless people. We are costless, and we need to warn up whoever is costless. Let's bring it. If a Brahmin male says, "I am no, I am an ex-Brahmin. Hereafter, can I be part of your community, brother? Come on in. You are part of us. Let's invent things together. Let's eat together. Let's share our things together. That's how we should go about. So inclusive community that we've been always curating belongs to everybody. Whoever is costless, whoever is uh, you know against gender inequalities, come on in. You are part of curating. That's how I would look at it. So Tamil professional, local knowledge, family archives, family archives. I kept moving in, in different villages and I will keep collecting written materials produced by families that were with them for long. And they have not been uh, worked on so seriously so far. So that is the thing I think we need to take care of the new tools and those families would have new tools and sources uh, that are important. Now, um, this is, you know, it's uh, the German code. So substantially what I'm saying, I'm, I'm doing German, I'm, I'm sort of trying to learn German, I'm doing okay right now, and I can read and write and speak a little bit. Sausages means made out of pork. This is part of my lesson. I thought I should share with you in my German studies. In this slide, you will see there are 1,500 sausages that are made in Germany right now. 
I want to do research and write about it. 1500 sausages is made out of pork meat. Pork sausage is part of the German culture. The moment I get come back from India when in Frankfurt, the first thing I do before I take my train, I buy a sausage bread and then eat and enjoy the taste of it. I love sausages and so deliciously made and it's part of the German culture. Why are we not able to talk about our fish eating culture, our meat eating culture and other forms that are connected with the ordinary people, dry food, whatever, right? So that's one instance. Another thing, um, look at this. This is a sushi, Japanese food. Look at the way the man is cutting the fish. This is a raw fish called tuna that is put on sushi food. The picture I'm going to show, will show very soon. The knife is very important for sushi fish cutting. And it's a big oil. It has come from centuries. Uh, in a way, samurai is also is connected with that kind of knife making, right? So look at the way he holds. It's art. It's a powerful picture. And the, if you don't cut the fish properly, guys who are eating, people, Japanese who are eating sushi food will not come back to your restaurant again. So it's a very religious kind of thing he is doing. The way he holds and cuts, or it could be a she too, right? So. So why can't we celebrate uh, our, you know, meat cutters and fish processors in the technology and their concentration? It's not easy. So we need to think about anthropologically and historically. This is sushi food. It has got all the ingredients out there. And what you see is, uh, I don't know whether you see the curses. This is a raw fish. This is a raw, uh, kind of semi-cooked uh, raw. And this is fish eggs. This is one meal. Fulfilling many and it's got rice base. This is made out of rice sushi. So without this knife and the way it is cut, you cannot get this. There is a connection between uh, uh, this artisanal aspects, the artifact of the knife. The knife is not good; it cannot be cut like that. So there is a whole industry of the ordinary people that has produced the food called sushi, which is a global food now. So there is a potential for us to think about like that about our own communities, um, and, and 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 that's how I think we should go about, uh, you know, raising questions, uh, finding new sources, new tools through our own language. Um, the mastery of the language has to be uh, kept up. Tamil should be spoken without English. When we speak English, we should speak English. When we speak German, we'll speak German, right? When a German speaks, you will not see one English word coming anywhere in between. Absolutely everything in German. I'm stunned. Like that Tamil, you should speak. And use that Tamil to dig up our own history and, and anthropology so that we have a, a, a vernacular history and anthropology, but a very critical one, questioning our own stigmas and, and you know, what we have wrongly normatized and what we have uh, wrongly naturalized and or raw materialized and naturalized and discriminate each other, it has got to go all the way down so that we become better humans, better Tamils and better Indians. I stop here. Nandri, Filan Dank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. <laughs> the inspiring speech. And you know, as I told you, as I told in the earlier. Uh, there, though it is theoretically charged and simple, valid, accessible, understandable by all who are, who are participated here, I, I, I see the participants remaining, <laughs> remaining and listening to our speech. Interesting, 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 and uh, um, make all of us to think about the history. You know, I, I remember a phrase uh, of uh, Arundhati Rai: uh, uh, "How deep shall we dig?" Right, so, <laughs> okay, I remember the phrase, you know, we need to dig up uh, more and more uh, about the history as uh, as is going on in Kiradi. Uh, you, as you rightly said, you know, uh, Kiradi is part of everybody. The very important phrase. You know, uh, should be articulated, uh, that phrase. Okay. Uh, um, there is a... Uh, one question Prabhu has uh, forwarded me from Dr. Rajiv Bargoti. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gajendran, I agree with your view of views about Brahmanical order of social orders. What do you think about Rigvedic social order? Don't you think Rigvedic society was without suppression 
and oppression and giving equal opportunity to all without discrimination and without rigidity of caste system please address okay uh, can i answer it now uh, professor balbrugan i can go ahead right right now yeah i can answer yeah. right okay good the only uh, question is forwarded now Right. Okay, no problem. No, so, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, in fact, I uh, I'm not a uh, uh, you know specialist in ancient history, and I have uh, uh, more of a modern history training. But yet, I, I this question whether there was Aryan uh, migration, or stroke invasion, was there or not? Some of my very progressive friends, Antikas friends, um, uh, you know. Um, left-leaning friends and all of them have said, no, no, this this is the defunct theory, Aryan theory, I think we should forget about it and talk. And so I was not fully uh, sure. So I went into reading Sanskritic work, and Sheldon Pollack, uh, particularly uh, Johannes Bronkos. He teaches in the University of Zurich, uh, Switzerland. He was trained in Pune. He's got a PhD from think, Pune University and uh, he's written a powerful book that I would recommend. How the Brahmins won. I repeat the title, How the Brahmins Won, from Alexander to, uh, I think, uh, Gup, uh, Gupta or something, I forget the second title. So he talks about that. So that book I would recommend. And there he clearly says on page nine, Johannes Bronco says in the book, How the Brahmins Won, uh, Alexander the Great had slaughtered, slaughtered Brahmins in around 1320 BC. Now, what surprises me, Johannes Bronkos doesn't talk about Alexander slaughtering Kshatriyas or Shudras or Dasas or Dasyus. My question is, why Alexander the Great chose to slaughter, kill? I mean, I would not use the word slaughter. when I, I think he has worked on Sanskrit texts and translated rightly. I may say killed and so on. So I'm very curious. From this, two things I understood. Number one, there were Brahmins, you know, uh, uh, from the Vedic times, we have Rigveda clearly talking about uh, uh, caste-based Varna system. Uh, there are evidences. Max Muller talks about it. Max Muller, the German scholar who died in 1900, celebrated in a way the Brandon Mill power perspective of the Vedas. In some ways, they say Vedic understanding uh, could have had a serious beginning without Professor Max Muller. But he was deeply, deeply influenced by Brahmin male perspective, which he celebrated. Brahmins, he used the word, you know, he himself wished, Max Muller said, hope, you know, I, you know, I wish I was born as a Brahmin, given the Vedic power they had. So clearly there were, uh, there was a Varna system, there was casteism in the Vedic time. And there is no, uh, you know, confusing way on that. And it had this subsequent implication uh, in the formation of Jati. So without Varna, which was fabricated during the Vedic system, we wouldn't have the, had the fabrication called caste. So it is interconnected. So I think we should not look for the romantic, uh, uh, you know, Vedic age. Instead, we should talk about, I would say, during the same time, my question is, who are the Dasis? Who are the Dasas? Uh, again, Roho, Johannes Broncos and Desh Pandey, Madhu Desh Pandey, they've written a book talking about these aspects. How do we understand Aryan and non-Aryan histories of the subcontinent? That book I would recommend again to understand how there were native communities which were caste free, who were prone to infliction from the Aryan uh, uh, migration and, 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 and invasion and so on. So I leave it at that. So the definitely Vedic time was but non caste based. Yes, okay. Uh, Prabhu. Uh, there is no question uh, because this uh, video is going to be on uh, uh, online uh, for you know uh, for, for for a day. Uh, all the participants, can, if you want to you know uh, uh, listen to the video again, you can uh, use your same link you know forwarded to you and you can uh, uh, listen to the uh, talk you know, again, and it will be posted on YouTube uh, shortly. And it will remain. Uh, okay. So if there is no any questions, uh, we'll go to the uh, go to the next one. Prabhu. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, any, any questions there? No, no, sir. That is it. Uh, we have few questions. Yes. 
but uh, most of them are repetitive and most of them are already answered by professor okay. so uh, i think uh, since we have for want of time we can uh, move on uh, for the next ideas uh, so. okay. okay okay thank you thank you thank you uh, for uh, <laughs> staying in connection with us you know we are delivered a uh, valuable speech really really uh, within a short time and prepared uh, you know powerpoint present the powerpoint it's all unimaginable in our side <laughs> so uh, really uh, thank you very much you know the formal vote of thanks will be delivered by dr anthony so thank you good evening everybody i feel privileged to present uh, a hearty vote of thanks for the successful webinar at the outset i would like to thank the principal dr segal sir for being instrumental in organizing this webinar thanks sir for your constant support and encouragement and also i thank uh, the resource person dr uh, gajendran ayathore for uh, providing an insight into vernacular history and also the other aspects uh, relating uh, to anthropology sir you have provided uh, an insight uh, which is exemplary thanks sir for your uh, uh, enlightened uh, for having enlightened us with your presence and also knowledge thank you sir and also i thank uh, uh, dr balamurgan for uh, uh, guiding the department from success to success and also from strength to strength i thank this uh, uh, this uh, great uh, noble person for uh, having come to our department thank you sir and also i remember uh, and uh, uh, thank dr uh, professor uh, jesudas arokyam for helping us to conduct uh, yet another uh, webinar last month with uh, professor uh, bernardi sami jose abraham and also uh, professor uh, kimo from the finland university as the resource persons also we find uh, a lot of uh, attendees uh, on the sunday evening i thank them uh, for uh, joining us in the successful webinar and also i take this opportunity for uh, thanking uh, dr uh, manjunathan the iqc coordinator and also the uh, technical support from uh, dr prabhu i also thank uh, the various staff members of my department and also the various uh, uh, guest lecturers for their unstinted support with this warm words i think uh, we are moving to the end of this uh, uh, webinar meeting and uh, i thank uh, everyone uh, uh, for making this uh, uh, webinar meeting a grand success thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for everybody thank, thank you, you. Thank okay thank you thank you thank you so i'll log out thanks i'll see you okay later. thank you yeah. bye, bye.